Are you crime curious? iHeart Podcast has gathered the best true crime all in one podcast feed. iHeart True Crime Plus. It's packed with podcasts about unsolved murders, missing persons, organized crime, and more. So there's always something good to binge and share iHeart True Crime Plus subscribers also enjoy ad-free listening, early access to select episodes, and exclusive bonus content. Subscribe to iHeart True Crime Plus today, exclusively on Apple Podcasts. The world of chocolate has been turned upside down. A very unusual situation. You saw the stacks of cash in our office. Chocolate comes from the cacao tree, and recently, varieties of cacao, thought to have been lost centuries ago, were rediscovered in the Amazon. There is no chocolate on earth like this. Now some chocolate makers are racing deep into the jungle to find the next game-changing chocolate. And I'm coming along. Okay, that was a very large crocodile. Listen to Obsessions Wild Chocolate on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts iHeartland is now open on Roblox. Tell everyone you know who loves Roblox. And tell everyone you know who loves music, games, and creating. In iHeartland, you'll see concerts from amazing artists like Lau. You'll play, you'll build, you'll hang out with other Roblox fans. Bringing people together. That's what iHeartland on Roblox is all about. Now open to get started. Check out iHeartRadio.com slash iHeartland. You're listening to 100 Words or Less with Ray Harkins. What's up, team? How's it going today, this afternoon, evening, whenever you're listening to it? I appreciate you caring about independent music. I appreciate you caring about this podcast. It's it's true. <laughs> I really do care because uh, people that engage with this thing, when there is so many other podcasts, movies, records to engage with, the fact that you decide to put aside some time in, in your day, in your busy week, to be able to hang out with us here, it really means a lot to me. Don't, I, I, I promise you, it does. We are here to talk about, if this is your first time joining us, welcome to the podcast, because I know that this guest is, uh, you know, he's quite, quite a big deal, as they say in the industry, <laughs> or I don't know, maybe they don't say that, but his name is David Ferrier. He is a filmmaker, a journalist. He also, uh, you know, contributes across so many different podcasts, including Armchair Expert with Dak Shepard, um, and he has done a show on Netflix called Dark Tourist. Uh, he's done a HBO documentary called Tickled. That's how I first came into uh, his orbit. But then got connected via mutual friends who were like, hey, th this guy, you know, you should know. <laughs> and I was like, okay, Aaron Harris from ISIS, the drummer of ISIS. I will talk to him. And I was already a fan of David's work. And actually, I... I think I mentioned this in the interview where I creepily uh, saw him <laughs> at an ISIS show, you know, some few years back when they uh, did a reunion show. But um, anyways, I'm just really excited because David, you know, maybe on the surface, like might not have a, much to do with independent music in some capacity, but he is a huge metalhead and we uh, dive deep to why music is at the core of his being. And uh, we just talk about a, a bunch of other stuff as well. But David is an incredibly kind human being, and he focuses on some pretty dark corners of the internet and the world at large. And uh, I'm just fascinated by him. And he also does a really, really cool substack called Webworm that I highly encourage you to subscribe to because he publishes great content there. And it's just always, like, no matter what, and every time I receive an email from his substack, I'm like... I know this is going to be weird. I know this is going to be wild. I can't wait to get into it. So you can email the show, 100wordspodcast at gmail.com. I also encourage you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts because it adds legitimacy to this thing. I would appreciate that immensely. Even if you've just listened to it for the first time and you're like, hey, this guy sucks. I don't want to listen to his podcast anymore. Uh, well, actually, you know what? Maybe hold that one back. <laughs> but if you enjoy it in some capacity, please leave a review. And um, yeah, let's just, let's dive into it, okay? David is a great dude, and like I said, consume his work, especially the stuff on Substack with Webworm, and then Dark Tourist on Netflix, and Tickled, the documentary on HBO. 
I, it's just incredible. So here we go. Let's dive into our conversation. I got I got brought into uh, your universe via Tickled, um, and actually via um, I, well, I, I'm going to call him a mutual friend, even though I don't even know him. <laughs> is uh, <laughs> D- David Chen from Slash Filmcast? Um, yes, yeah, I feel like he's my friend also, but I also don't know him personally. <laughs> right, right. It's like yeah, he's he's sung your praises for a while, but yeah, his his description of Tickled made me be like, oh, this this is interesting. Um, and then obviously watching the 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 film was uh, you know profoundly impactful on a, a variety of different reasons for me. Um, and then further with dark tourist. Um, and then, but frankly, what made me m- most endeared to you was, uh, you know, the fact that we obviously got pulled together via a mutual friend of, you know, Aaron Harris from ISIS. And I was, uh, then it, it just kind of like all kind of clicked together in my head where I was like, Oh, of course, David is, is a weirdo interested in subcultures because that's something that's, <laughs> He's, he's probably been into his whole life. And like, I, uh, you know, I mean, especially when you're talking about in relation to music and I, I found that, like I said, it all kind of clicked into place. Um, you know, does that kind of track with you in regards to, uh, the idea of being attracted to things that are, you know, quote unquote, less than normal, like that's kind of always been who you are, or that's been something that you've just kind of, I guess, learned over time. <laughs> uh, it was kind of, no, I think you're, you're totally correct. I think, uh, probably kind of heavier music has been something I've been into for since my late teens. And I, I got into, I guess music and a lot of music that my friends didn't listen to came to me sort of a little bit late in the game. Cause I was, I went to quite, I went to a Christian school and I was raised in quite a, uh, a reasonably Christian household. And that was kind of my life. You know, I was, I was uh, like head prefect uh, and, and during my final year of school and I would, open assembly by praying so i was like super religious and then uh a guy called rodney handed me like a bunch of albums um in one of those those like record sleeves where you've just got like 20 cds or like smashed into a thing and he's just like you've got to listen to some of this and i see i just i discovered a lot of artists uh including um including a little bit later on isis who yeah just propelled me into a world and a subculture that I didn't know existed and then became like a really big part of my life. I got so, I think because I came to it so late in my life, I just really got into it in a really big way. And I went to as many concerts as I could and I got as many like hard to find records as I could and mer- merchandise. And I just got really into, into metal specifically. And it was, yeah, it's a subculture and that sort of bled into my work because I just ended up uh, discovering other subcultures and I just really liked diving into these worlds that were quite different to what I was accustomed to. Right, right. I, I mean, it makes sense. I, I like the, it, this is a thread I was going to pull on a little bit later, but the the notion that, you know, most people view you know, New Zealand as its own, um, you know, either Australia's hat or, you know, it's, it, it's own thing where it's like, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's, it's isolated for many different reasons. And so I was curious about your journey of being exposed to that. Cause realistically, like, you know, especially with whatever punk, hardcore and metal, like most, you know, countries or uh, regionalities, you're able to point to a few bands from there, but New Zealand for the most part, like, hasn't put a lot of output in regards to that. Yes. Like, I guess, regionally speaking, maybe has done some damage in like, you know, Australia or whatever, but like it made an impact over here in America is, you know, far less, uh, I guess, substantial for lack of a better term. Yeah. And I guess I, I guess a lot of the music I was exposed to earlier was American music. Like that, I, there wasn't a lot of stuff in New Zealand in that particular scene that I found, uh, I guess would match what I was listening to from overseas. There was a, there's a band, the Mint Chicks, who are just um, so incredibly talented and they have some pretty punky aspects to them. Uh, but they're two brothers, um, Ruben and Cody, and they, I've never seen a band be more um, dangerous or outrageous on stage. I mean, we have a festival here, the Big Day Out, which is, I guess, like our version of, 
Coachella, but much smaller because it's in New Zealand. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. you know, they got a chainsaw out and started like chainsawing the stage down. And <laughs> that was like really doing some damage. Uh, and, and the festival was not happy. But, you know, hang, just hanging from rafters and just doing the. I, I have not seen a band be more more charismatic and dangerous than the mint chicks and that both those brothers have gone on to do different things and one of those brothers um ended up uh fronting a band called unknown mortal orchestra which is actually i think they're based oh, yeah. in portland now um, yeah and i've heard of, i've heard of them yeah yeah and it's, it's it's a you know it's a it's a pretty mellow genre of music that they make but yeah then ruben ended up doing um the music for dark tourist um, our title music. So I haven't even really thought of this this particular evolution, but you know, one of the first bands I really responded to in New Zealand was the Minchicks, and yeah, then one one half of the Minchicks ends up scoring um, a, a show I make. Uh, That's, you know, I love that. Later, it's yeah. I hadn't really thought of that. Those literally some of the first shows in New Zealand, yeah, were the Minchicks that I went to. That's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, I and honestly, I, I think it is uh, you just realizing that and making that connection, I, I think that, I mean, honestly, I think it's really indicative of people that, you know, kind of come up within the context of, you know, I use this in air quotes, like scene, like the whole DIY independent mm. nature of that is really like, you know, you, you do stuff, you don't ask permission, you just kind of put your art out in the world, not really knowing if anyone will care about it. And then, hopefully what you put out there will attract, you know, it doesn't need to be a large amount of people, but like you start to build your audience from that perspective of people like, Oh yeah, I'm also interested in serial killers and weirdo stuff or whatever. No, totally. And I actually, I remember again, another thing. um, And it's so funny how these these things come around. I failed miserably to make a documentary back in 2009. I went to Mongolia uh, because they have this like mythical creature called the Mongolian death worm. And I, it's kind of like their Loch Ness monster or their, you know, their version of Bigfoot. It's their big monster that everyone talks about. And so I spent a month in the Gobi with my friend. Um, we just put our own money in and just went over there and filmed uh, people. We had a translator, but filmed um, eyewitness accounts of this crazy, you know, two meter long death worm, which would, you know, shoot acid out its mouth and um and fire lightning from its anus allegedly uh and you know when when we were fundraising to go over for that uh again some of the the matrix offered um you know they're like oh can we score this film if you make it and i never made it because it was just i didn't know what i was doing and i shot everything you know we shot some beautiful pictures but i didn't know what i was doing as a director and it's i sort of got back to new zealand it's all in mongolian uh hadn't shot a lot of elements i needed and it's literally just sitting there gathering dust but yeah i just they they were there then offering support and i was fans of the mint chicks and to sort of have them offering to score this film i was yet to make was amazing but i'm glad it, it circled back with dark tourists where they actually could record some music for me right but you're like hey i can actually uh you know pay you a little money for this like <laughs> yeah you know exactly but it's like it's so nice it is so nice when people you admire uh end up you know, potentially liking something that you've made. And it is, you know, I think independent artists and, you know, I think there's a really neat community created and there's lots of swapping going on and people want to help and people are engaged because they know how hard it is, you know, and so Mm -hmm. everyone wants to help. And if you can uh, respond to someone else's art and, and help out, then I think there's, there's a really amazing world to tap into. Absolutely. No, I agree. And actually you, uh, just thinking about, you know, other New Zealand artists, like the only band that I really kind of had a, a, a personal touch point with was that band Jacob, like J A K O B. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful music. Those guys. Yeah. I, they, I saw them opening. They either open for ISIS or maybe they open for tool in either New Zealand or Australia, but yeah, those guys are so the stuff they make is so otherworldly and, and incredible. I, I love those guys. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, Ken, and we'll we'll obviously pull some of those threads a little bit later in regards to um, you know the music and the introduction of it, and obviously the influential uh, CD binder that you got. <laughs> but the you know I, I know like you mentioned, you know you were raised in a, a very uh, you know religious household, and obviously went to you know high school and or mm. they 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 call it high school in we call it high school here. We call okay, it high school. yeah, okay. not 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 secondary or primary and all those. <laughs> yeah, um, we got it. 
but you, uh, I'm going to, you know, guess, because I know you were born and raised in uh, New Zealand, but uh, what was the name of the actual town that you grew up in? I, I didn't... grew up in uh, Bethlehem. Uh, okay, in, there you in go. A town called Tauranga. So, yeah, very in line with my um, upbringing. Right, right. And is it, uh, I guess, rural, for lack of a better term, or what's the... <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> okay. it is. It's, it's pretty quiet. Um, there wasn't a lot going on in Bethlehem. Uh, like, the town itself, Bethlehem is in Tauranga, and it's pretty much a retirement village. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it was pretty quiet. Got it, got it. And what was your uh, f- family structure like growing up? Like mom and dad in the house, uh, brothers and yeah, sisters? Yeah, I had, I had a super, um, I had a really cool upbringing, actually. I, my dad worked as a veterinarian, um, and my mum was a vet nurse. And so just animals everywhere in the house. Like we had like, I had like a pet goat that I'd take to school with me and tie up outside the front gate. <laughs> and, and you know, we, we had like ducks and dogs and cats and all the, and parrots. And so it was like a really, um, I, I grew up with like a lot of animals and um, I've got one brother um, four years older than me, Robert. And he was like, he was the really cool one at school. He'd play, uh, he was like, the sportsman and he'd be on the like the best on the basketball team and and i was just this massive nerd who um just had pimples and glasses and i tried to play the saxophone so i was one of those kids that had to walk around with like a big saxophone case which didn't endear me to anybody uh so yeah i i had a great i had a really great upbringing massive nerd um and again, that's probably music offered me kind of a bit of an escape from that world um, a little bit later on. But yeah, it's growing up was a great time. I uh, big into animals, as you, if anyone that follows my Instagram will just see, I still am obsessed with animals. So that's a uh, that's a hangover from my my upbringing. Right, right. Did um, and it's funny that you. I mean, especially with the uh, notion of you being surrounded by animals and like, uh, you know, I know. I mean, I'm speaking from my stepfather. He's a veterinarian, um, but right. I am. Yeah, but I I am like technically allergic. I mean, I have different sort of reactions to certain animals. So like, but there was no, there was no hope of me continuing on in the practice. So like, was there a, a, a focus being like, oh, like David is going to continue on with the animal business? No, the great thing with my the great thing with my parents is there was never any pressure to do anything in particular. They just wanted me to do what I wanted to do. So. I originally, I was, um, I did a year of pre-medicine um, with the idea of being a doctor at some point, but I, as I was studying, uh, I just found out, I think like probably a lot of people do when they try and get into med school, you know, you think you're smart at your little rural rural school, and then you, you go to university and find out you're actually quite stupid <laughs> compared to everyone else. Sure. So, uh, no, but med. I just basically I, I discovered that that med school wasn't for me, and uh, I hated blood and I hated guts. And while I was studying that, I ended up uh, uh, working a little bit at the local radio station at the university and writing for the university magazine. And so when I kind of made the jump for a variety of reasons, to sort of get into journalism. You know, you think most parents would be pretty annoyed if they're if their child went from medicine to journalism, because you'd be like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are yep. you doing, my child? But no, my parents were really chill. They were just like, oh, just do what makes you happy. And that philosophy is of sort of, yeah, I feel very lucky that there was never any pressure um, to do anything in particular. And you know, when I stumbled into journalism, I'm really glad I did, because I think I would have been a really fucking terrible doctor. <laughs> Right. Yeah. You're like, especially too, where I, I find it interesting because I know are, are, you're vegan or vegetarian or you kind of fluctuate between the two. I, I fluctuate. Yeah. I know. I fluctuate. <laughs> no, like even worse. I fluctuate between like meat eating and vegetarianism. Uh, and it depends what, uh, it depends where I am in the world and, and sure. the other thing. it's bad. I'm, I'm rambling now because I feel like called out on it. <laughs> No, no, it's a, I, I don't, I, the only reason I bring that up is just because the, uh, you know, there, there are many, uh, you know, people that practice medicine within the context of animals and many of them don't even make the connection that just like, oh yeah, like, you know, like, uh, of course we need to, you know, test animals in laboratories, but like, I'll, I'll help those animals. It is just kind of like oh, that, it's, that uh, weird juxtaposition. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So weird. But no, yeah. I, I do. I would love to be a vegetarian. I just am too lazy at times. I'm working. It's on a, 
It's okay. You're a poser, David. It's no big. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Well, the thing is, there's this big, I go on this big diatribe in Dark Tourist after seeing this really brutal pig slaughter in Indonesia that I am going to go vegetarian. And so a a lot of questions I still get now are like, did you go vegetarian? Did you go vegetarian? And I did for about eight months. And then I just lazily slipped back into eating meat again. So I'm constantly being guilt tripped about this because I I said, you know, (laughs) on this show that I was going to go vegetarian. And when you say that, you really should be called out on it. It's it, <laughs> well, and it, the the reason I bring it up too is because you know much of the uh, the subculture within the context of you know punk and hardcore and stuff like you know animal rights is weaved in throughout it, and so a lot of people are exposed yeah. to those ideas at an earlier age than you know maybe some of uh, the peers. Because I mean, it's like I I mean whatever yeah. I've been ve- I've been vegan and vegetarian for you know since I was in high school, but like I remember that notion amongst my friends was very much just like what the hell are you talking about? Like so it's that mm-hmm. evolution of exposition to the idea is what something that, uh, you know, makes people not only have to consider it, but then figure out how it obviously, uh, integrates within their life. So I totally understand where you're coming from. Yeah. And I think, uh, probably my experience with music was I obviously missed the meat message and I was more, I sort of more, I think got the idea of thinking a little bit more independently. And I think probably my journey away from religion, and organized religion was definitely that wouldn't have happened without music. So I, again, I think that's why I feel so passionate about the music I like is because I just associate it so heavily with the direction my life went in and in a really positive way. And so, uh, yeah, so I'm rambling again, but you get the idea. No, I, 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 no, I get it. Well, and especially too, because it's interesting where, uh, and I'm sure you may have had a, this experience where a lot of people that start to get into music can only listen to music through this particular lens. You know, if it's like whatever, oh, I can listen to a B rate Christian hardcore or metal band because it's a Christian band as opposed to like, of course, I can't listen to Slayer. Like, you know, my parents will throw me out of the house or whatever. Did you, was there any, I guess, was there any kind of influence in regards to that? Like, oh, yes, you can listen to Striper, but you can't listen to that? Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, I did so, there was so much mental gymnastics going on when I started getting into, because, yeah, so I, you know, the music I listened to as a teenager was all, like, Christian, um, (laughs) so embarrassing, uh, Christian rock. Um, And when I say rock, it would be sort of Christian pop, really. Um, And... So when I started listening to music that wasn't, I mean, I remember getting the downward spiral um, when I was, uh, when I was probably 16 and I, it was such a confronting thing because I love that album so much, but then you come, you know, there's certain tracks on there that are um, one track in particular, that's particularly um, anti-religion. And so I like, I was like, I, I just don't listen to that one. And I'd always skip that track. Uh, whereas I figured I sort of found ways mentally around the rest of it being okay in my belief system. Uh, and so I'd have these weird little, and then, and then I, when I, when I left school and, um, I was in that year of medicine, I sort of, that was when I was sort of, I guess, starting to really be heavily conflicted with my beliefs, but because I went to a, a like a Christian hostel, I sort of was my last a- attempt where I was like, no, I've got to be, like, I've got to be a Christian. I've got to make this work. And I just remember this day where I took like all, a lot of my like metal collection and music and vinyls and I sold them all at this record store. And I had like quite a big collection of, of music by then. <laughs> and it was like a symbolic thing where it's like, if I sell this stuff, it, this is like the evil holding me back. I will like get back into Christianity full on and live this and this, live this particular life. And like a couple of days after I'd sold all those records, I was just <laughs> like hit me like a freight train. I was like, "What the fuck have I done? Like this is crazy!" And right. I I literally spent years because um, you know that collection. I went back to the record store and all the stuff had gone because it was sort of collectible stuff and it was, you know, people would have just come in there and bought it. And so all my collection, zoom, gone, right. get it back. And so I spent like the next, uh, probably decade kind of getting all that stuff back again. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, my, um, 
my musical kind of taste and journey was was unusual in that it was I sort of censored myself for a number of years before fully embracing things, and I'm still catching up, you know. <laughs> well, and I, it really is. I mean, especially when you're kind of talking about the different layers that you're experiencing, like not only existing in New Zealand, that uh, you know is a, a isolated country in and of itself, but then on top of it, there's another layer of isolation in regards to culture. Be like, yes, yeah, so you can only consume you know this little sliver, um, you know, because I mean, especially here in America, like there were so many of these labels, like uh, you know, specifically with like tooth and nail and solid state, they were putting out you know whatever mxpx and like a lot of these bands that kids could listen to in the 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 confines of a church but not be confronted with what you had to do with the nine inch nails record where you're like oh damn uh well i can't i don't i can't listen to that song right now because of this so i i i can completely understand where you're coming from yeah it was just it was just such a funny um a funny way of thinking about things and i think it's sort of i just got to the point where i just realized that if i if some art is helping me so much in my life and I'm enjoying it so much and it's cathartic, why in the world would I, would I exist in a belief system that doesn't allow me to embrace that stuff? And it just, I think I just relax so much from then on. And it's, it's, again, it's kind of led into the work I do where I, I guess a lot of my work is kind of based around subcultures and I just, I love nothing more than diving into a world that isn't mine and just trying to learn about it and, you know, I feel lucky to be able to do that. And there's, uh, there's just been nothing more boring I could think of than just spending all my time with people that think like me and, and do things like me. And I just want to try and keep being surprised in that, in that space. Sure. Uh, well, and I, I think it really leans into, you know, this is me playing a little armchair psychologist on <laughs> you, but like the, I, I think it leans into your curiosity. Like when you find something that you're interested in, it seems like you really roll up your sleeves and are just like, well, okay. I need to find out as much as I possibly can about this. And then on top of it, your personality, uh, at least the, you know, the public display of your personality mm-hmm. of the idea that you are, you're confrontational up to a point, but then you're also, you know, in my opinion, and correct me if you, if you feel like I'm wrong, but like you are very, uh, you know, not threatening, <laughs> like, no, <laughs> you know, like, it, I, I mean, very, no, yeah, no, very- right. <laughs> so yeah, it's like no, no one no. no one feels like you're gonna fight people immediately you know no no and i uh, i i think i i probably grew up with the louis thoreau school of um sort of documentary where it's always more conversational than confrontational and i think there can be nothing more boring than just people sort of picking fights on screen and trying to like have your sort of a gotcha moment with someone that you're investigating or uh, looking into yeah, and I, 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 I like to have empathy with everyone that I meet. And I just think it's much more interesting if you, even if you're with someone that is terrible or objectively um, not, you know, I guess I can tickle just someone who's not behaving very well. I'd rather have a, a normal conversation with them or just sort of a level-headed conversation as opposed to trying to accuse them of things or getting really up in their face. I'd rather just be just like incredibly chilled out and just see what happens. And I think often, you know, bad people will reveal themselves on screen in the way I act and the way they act. And if I can sort of be a counterpoint to that and just be calm and reasonable, I think it can sometimes make for more, um, I know more interesting scenes and a more interesting um, film or series or whatever I'm doing. So yeah, totally accurate. I am. um, uh, I'm also a coward. I don't like fighting. (laughs) I I don't. Right. (laughs) I don't like confrontation. I think there's nothing worse than that. And I think that's where, when a lot of my friends realize that I like the sort of music I listen to, uh, uh, they're just, you know, I I just remember going to a Meshuggah show um, pre-pandemic in New Zealand. They played this really small venue here. And I played some friends in the car um, this this music that I was going to be listening to. And they just didn't understand, like they did not understand um, what was going on. And, and I, I think I listen to such, I know I, I love aggressive, louder music and it's just so it, I think people think that everyone in that scene is why do you know, that stereotype of angry or, or angsty, but it's the, it's the opposite. And that, that's part of the reason I like that scene as well. That like everyone is so kind and you're just like a lot of nerds essentially. Um, and a lot of people like me who are just quiet and mellow and it's sort of a, 
I think, a way to process the world a little bit, or at least it has been for me. Well, it can also, I mean, realistically, you can, uh, by de facto, like place yourself in these aggressive scenarios in a healthy way, you know, like uh, whatever. Exactly. I, exactly. Yeah. 100%. yeah. And, I, and I haven't overthought it all this stuff too much. It's funny. I, uh, it's, yeah, I don't intellectualize any of the stuff too much. Like I know what I like and I kind of don't think about it much more beyond that, but you're totally, you're totally right. Yeah, <laughs> no. And I think that's uh, an important facet for when you start to develop your own tastes in music and you start to have authorship over it is that you're listening to these things kind of devoid of context. You're not listening to them in the placement of a scene or a lineage where it's like, yes, you do understand like, oh yes, I like Meshuggah and I understand that, you know, at the gates begot them and blah, blah, blah. And you go back in the timeline, but it's not like you are listening to these things um, by being like, oh, I got to be cool. So I got to listen to this or whatever, you know, it's just like you start to like the stuff you like. Totally. And I think all the music, the, the music that I like as well is almost it's it's not something that you instantly love. I think the the music that I love the most, you kind of have to work at it and lose yourself in it. And uh, you know, I think some of those albums that just reveal themselves to you over a long period of time are the ones that stick with you, uh, stick with you the longest. Which is why I think I can never, I can never quite, em- I could never embrace pop music in a way because the songs I love that I hear like once or twice, but then. I just couldn't live with that, that particular, like, yeah, I think anything you, your brain instantly likes, you've got to be a little bit suspicious of because you're going to get so sick of it. Whereas if you've got to work at something and really let it sink into your, like your soul and your being, then that's the stuff that, that lives with you much longer. Yeah. Oh, I, I agree. I mean, there it's the, <laughs> it's the notion of, you know, the sugary sweet, you know, ice cream, that's obviously great going down, but then you're like, oh, I'm not, there's, I'm not left with any sustenance. Like maybe I should have had, you know, yeah, beans. No, totally. <laughs> I, totally. It's exactly that. It's springtime. The weather is changing. You probably need new band merch for your life, right? How about you go to rockabilly.com dive into this promo code PC 100 words, and it gets you 15% off your order. They have so much amazing stuff. It all ships from the Midwest, from their warehouse, all officially licensed. And you can't even believe the sort of deals that they have there. They got, they have pillows, they have throw blankets, they have amazing long sleeves. They have everything you could possibly want. And even right now they have a grab bag deal Four t-shirts for $15. Like, that is a great deal. I don't care who you are or what you like. You will probably be able to find some rad deals at rockabilly.com. And like I said, they're all officially licensed. So none of this bootleg stuff, these bands are getting paid. It's all above the board. So again, go to rockabilly.com. Use this code PC100Words. That gets you 15% off your order. Essentially, I'm giving you free merch, okay? So just go ahead, dive into it, and enjoy. And thank you always, Rockabilia, for your support. I love dogs so much. That's why I'm incredibly excited to welcome Embark on as a sponsor. They are a dog DNA testing kit. And what makes them cool is they scan for 215 genetic health risks across 350 breeds. And I want to give you $60 off and free shipping. So go to EmbarkVet.com, use the promo code Ray, and it unlocks that offer. And it also unlocks so many cool things that you can find out about your pup. And it's super easy. You get a little test tube with a Q-tip. You put it in the pup's mouth, send it back to Embark. They email you all of these results. It's very fast, easy, and I love doing it. 72% of pup parents are puzzled when it comes to their dog's breed. It's time to end these guessing games. This holiday season, give the dog lover in your life something they won't expect. The chance to decode their dog. It's the perfect time to shop for an Embark dog DNA test. Right now, Embark has a limited time offer on their breed and health kit and purebred kit for listeners of this show. Go to EmbarkVet.com to get free shipping and save $60 with promo code Ray. Visit EmbarkVet.com and use promo code Ray to save $60 today. Do it for your pup. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Wouldn't it be absolutely incredible if you got an instruction guide for life? where you're going through some relationship issues or drama at work or whatever challenging situation that is presented to you, you got a little pamphlet that helped you walk through that. What's awesome about therapy is that it kind of is. 
You're able to speak to a third person, talk about the issues you're having, and they can maybe offer some solutions for you that you can get unstuck. BetterHelp has connected over 3 million people and counting with licensed therapists. 100% online. So that means it is more convenient, more accessible, and more affordable. You just fill out a brief questionnaire and you get matched with the therapist in less than 48 hours. If things are not vibing between you and the therapist, you can switch out to a new therapist at any time. You got no waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. It's an amazing service and I wholeheartedly endorse them. Learn more and save 10% off your first month when you sign up today at betterhelp.com slash Ray. That's betterhelp.com slash Ray. Get some therapy and get unstuck. Football is back, and BetMGM is inviting new customers to join the huddle and enjoy the action like never before. Sign up today using bonus code JERSEY, and your first wager is risk-free, up to $1,000. You'll also have instant access to a variety of parlay selection features, player props, and boosted odds specials. Just download the BetMGM app today or go to BetMGM.com and enter a bonus code JERSEY and place your first wager risk-free up to $1,000. The BetMGM app is the perfect way to experience the excitement of wagering on live sports. Now in more markets than ever. Visit BetMGM.com for terms and conditions. Must be 21 years of age or older to wager. New Jersey only. New customer offer. All promotions are subject to qualification and eligibility requirements. Rewards issued as non-withdrawable free bets or site credit. Free bets expire seven days from issuance. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. And I, I, I'm going to presume that uh, your exposure to kind of like, you know, going to concerts and shows and like live music, um, was that more so kind of after, you know, whatever, in, in college and once you started to, you know, experience the broader world at large? Uh, or did you go to, you know, concerts and shows when you were a little bit younger? No, when I was younger, it was all, it would all be uh, Christian shows. So we had this festival called the Parachute Festival, which was a Christian music festival. And so, um, Back then, I was probably there were these bands like uh, DC Talk and Newsboys, and oh so, yeah, um, <laughs> the good stuff, the good stuff, very familiar. Yeah, I mean, so many like the most mainstream of Christian music, like it, it was just so. But that's the stuff I'd listen to, and so that was those were the sort of gigs I'd go to when I was at school, uh, and probably my probably like the first big concert i went to or the first concert i went to was probably a tool show which is a bit embarrassing to say because i know that tool is like this big kind in new zealand it's like very uh do you you know bogan do you know the word bogan no (laughs) it's like just a bit like idiotic you know like the music is idiotic but it attracts a really idiotic crowd here Maybe like, like a of, like a meathead, maybe. Yeah, like, meathead. Yeah, meatheaded. And I think just people that want to feel like they're smart. And that band attracts those kinds of people. <laughs> sure. But, but I um I caught it would have been the Lateralis tour probably around two thousand and one, um, at the North Shore Event Centre here in New Zealand. And I saw that and I was just blown away. I was just I think, you know, and that was a big show, um, relatively speaking. And that was probably like the first the first really transformative musical experience I had. And I wasn't drunk. I wasn't on acid. I wasn't on MDMA. I was just, just the music just blew my mind. Um, and from there I started going to more and more shows and I'd moved cities. So I discovered where some of the venues were and weirdly, actually the, I, I'm in an apartment at the moment and I am, they built the apartment building on top of like my favorite music venue, which closed down three or four years ago. Wow. And it's where I saw ISIS for the first time. And they, um, I'm literally, so I'm just looking at the poster now because I just looked it out and Jacob opened for them. <laughs> That's that nice. Was, <laughs> um, Saturday, Feb 10th, 2007 at the King's Arms Tavern. And I, I literally live on top of that, where that venue was now. Wow. Um, but, and I am the King's Arms <clears throat> you know, I saw so many, I saw so many bands that I, um, I love like Dillinger Escape Plan played there heaps of times. Um, the White Stripes played there at one point. And, and these are all, I think I, I'm, I am pretty mainstream, I think, in the kind of stuff I listen to, like it's, it's obscure to some people, but I think it is pretty, you know, I'm not insanely niche with what I listen to. Um, but I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, moving, moving to university in Auckland and discovering little music venues 
and seeing bands like the Mint Chicks play in these small pack clubs and on rooftops, that's when I started experiencing music. I think probably between like the ages of 18, 19, 20, that kind of, that kind of base. That's yeah. I mean, that, that's obviously the sweet spot for most people once they are, you know, able to spread their wings a little bit and, you know, be able to decide, and like we were talking about previously, like the authorship and, you know, you deciding like, oh yeah, like religion, this whole thing that I was like raised in, it's not, not, not so much for me. And like, oh, I want to yeah, go to these shows. And, yeah, there's more yeah. to life than this particular thing. And yeah, it's, yeah, I'm very appreciative of yeah, because some people don't do that. And I think they, they stay trapped in a certain belief system. And I'm very glad that I got away from that a wee bit. Yeah. Um, the the path of, you know, you ending up in, in journalism and, you know, you're pursuing the kind of uh, projects mm. that you focus on. Um, like you said, it's, it was, you know, kind of in, I don't want to use the word opposition, but definitely wasn't uh, expected, you know, as you were matriculating through school and stuff like that. Um, and then especially too, with the notion of, you know, I find it interesting that, uh, and maybe this is uh, me just assuming things, but mm. y- you generally speaking seem, uh, you know, comfortable on television. And that is a learned trait. Uh, so I'm going to guess that like when you started, first started, you know, appearing on TV and, you know, doing the, the broadcast stuff, was that hard for you to adjust to that? Or was that something that you were like, oh, oh no, absolutely. Okay. I was so, yeah, I was. I'm still pretty petrified of public speaking. And when I first, so yeah, I, I did my three years of journalism school and then ended up in a newsroom in New Zealand at TV three. And I got, uh, I got a job as the sort of the, the cultural reporter on our late night news show, which was the dream place because I would literally interview bands that came into town. So anyone touring that I liked, I would get to go and interview them because there's not a lot of competition when a band comes to right. them because we don't right. have any outlets. And so I would always get a spot. And so it wasn't due to my skill or anything like that as a journalist or, or a reporter. It was purely there were no other options. And so I would, you know, I met so many of my heroes um, over, <clears throat> over that time because every band that came to New Zealand I could meet with. And I did that role for maybe five or six years. Uh, and yeah, I was a wreck when I started doing that. I would, I'd get sweaty on camera. I would get nervous. I, uh, but it just, you do it enough and you obviously, you kind of gain confidence and you find out who you are because I think when you start in a TV newsroom, you kind of put on a reporter voice and you act like how you think you're meant to act. But over time, I kind of, thanks to a really creative producer that kind of let me be me let me start doing stories in a slightly different way and writing the scripts with my own voice and being, bringing some humor into things a little bit, which wasn't typical in our newsroom. Uh, and I just, you know, so by the time something like tickled presented itself in sort of 2014, 2015, I was confident enough to just be comfortable on camera and just to be myself. And, uh, but it, it took, a, it took a long time to get to that, that, that point. And, the newsroom was like the perfect place because, you know, each day you're doing a story. And the brilliant thing with the newsroom is that, you know, you're only as good as your last story. So if you if you if you fucked up, no one cared. Like you just the next day, everything would be reset and you just do it again. It's not like your career is over. So it was the perfect place to learn. And I, I wouldn't be able, I think, to work in documentary if I hadn't had those years in the newsroom, just like figuring out who I was and the kinds of stories I wanted to tell. Sure. Well, I I really like the uh, way you articulated it in regards to just being, um, not acting. Cause I think that most people, that's where you uh, automatically assume like whatever medium you were doing, it's like, Oh, because you know, right now we're doing audio. We need to put on our audio voice, David. And it's like, that that's where people go. And it, it isn't until you do it a couple of times to realize like, Oh, that maybe I shouldn't do that because that's what everyone else is doing. And like, I should probably just bring more of me to the table in order to, yeah, like, it's too, it's too much effort. And it's, it's a confidence thing as well. You know, when you begin, you don't have confidence. So you kind of need to pretend to be other people, I think. But yeah, the more you make things and do things, the, the more important it is just to be yourself. And it, it makes it less stressful as well, because you're not acting half the time. You're just, 
doing what you I, I say that what you see of me on screen is pretty much me it's it's not much different i mean i might sometimes be a little bit more naive or a little bit less uh i think probably in my day-to-day existence i get a bit more uh opinionated and i just try and let things ride out on camera and not sort of interrupt people i just sort of let people talk uh but yeah it's it's much less effort if you're not pretending and you're not acting um else i would have gotten into acting you know but i think journalism and documentary you should just be yourself and um bring your own ship to the table and be your f- and, and be original in that way and i think that really helps sure absolutely you mentioned this previously in regards to, you know, I mean, like playing saxophone and like, clearly yeah, that's like crazy. not, you know, that, yeah, right. That's not, so that's crazy. not a, right. <laughs> did you play clarinet before? Or did you just dive right into the saxophone? No, I went from like recorder to saxophone. <laughs> oh, recorder David, that is. When I was like seven years old to, yeah, picking up the saxophone when I was about maybe 14, 15. And I just, I just have no natural musical ability. It's just not in me. And it was, it's such a bad instrument to give a kid if they're not good at music. Like it's just awful. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that, that's like borderline mean because yeah, it's no, awful, awful to people around me, awful to myself. I'll just remember like how gross, like the reed gets and like, cause you're just spitting into the thing and like breathing. It's just like, it's such a gross instrument. Um, if you don't know how to play it, like the most, it's so beautiful to hear it played well. Um, but if you don't know how to play it, disaster. Absolutely, for sure. I mean, yeah, you you could have you if you had any proclivity at it, you could have you know joined a ska band, and your life could have been a whole different thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my god, I went. I um, I went because uh, New Zealand. We we. I, I don't mean to gloat, but we're sort of living a normal life. Like we go. Yes, you are. Yes, we we took a very hard line to to COVID, and I was at dinner a month ago and. Uh, this we were next to this club and the club came out and we were looking at um, the, the people that had come out and we're like, what are they seeing? Like, what gig is this? Oh my God. And the woman was like, oh, it's Scarfest down there. <laughs> like, oh, that's New Zealand Scar crowd. That's what they look like. Yep. And I'm sure too. Lovely people, lovely people, just a very specific of course. look. It, it well, especially at this <laughs> juncture of time too, <laughs> yeah. where it's like that—that that is, you know, a very uh, joyful music. But at the you know, at the same time, like ska is not on the uh, cultural mainstream tip as it once was in the early nineties. <laughs> no, no, and it's a genre that I've ne- I've never really understood. But it was just very funny to be eating in this really qu- quiet um, sort of forecourt, and then suddenly just to be just like obviously this gig had finished and just to be surrounded by scar enthusiasts it was yeah, it was very funny yeah a lot of lot, lot of plaid a lot of two tones right oh, yeah but yeah no i was not destined for scar because i was not a good saxophone player i can assure you of that <laughs> right and so i i'm gonna guess uh, because like you were talking about you had no uh musical proclivity whatsoever uh did you ever have a desire to play in a band but you knew that you couldn't get there oh it's always been my fantasy yeah like i'd love to sing in a band or be a or be um, on stage in that way. I just think it would be, because I think that would be sort of a place where you could have a bit of a persona and have fun with it and have, and yeah, I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to have done that, but I just, I'm, I'm not an idiot. And I just know that I, I can't sing. I can't do anything. Like it's just, that is not something that I'm capable of doing, but in another life, I mean, I love music so much and I would, I'd love to be inside that scene in some way. But I think that's probably why I'm such a passionate fan of certain things because I um, I know I can't do them. So why not just be a really big fan of people that can? Sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're like, I'll, I will be an advocate for you because be I cannot advocate. accomplish it. Exactly. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a music advocate. So. Right. I like it. Yeah, uh, and looking at your work, like we were talking about, you know, between Tickled, Dark Tourist, like these are... Um, you know, very uh, singular visions in regards. So it's not saying that no one else has done documentaries on, you know, weird subcultures because I mean, essentially that's what, you know, that's what documentary (laughs) documentaries are meant to highlight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But it it seems to me that uh, this has all spawned off of, you know, your ideas and obviously working with other people to kind of execute these ideas. Um, But it very, you know, similar to what we were talking about at the very beginning, just kind of that, that DIY nature of trying to bring something to life that, uh, you know, is not ostensibly going to be quote unquote commercially successful where you're just like, I just need to get this thing out of me. Um, where does that kind of 
come from in you? Is it, would it, you just attribute that to like your curiosity or where do you think that that kind of manifests yeah, itself? It's, I, I, no, I'm definitely curious about the world and I feel like I had so many years of my life not being curious about things. And so I feel like I'm catching up. Like I just want to experience every strange thing I can and meet everyone that isn't like me and learn from them. But I think I'm also, I'm, I'm quite OCD. So I, I need to, I need to have things in a certain place. And I think when I get a story that I think is a good story that I'm interested in, I'm just so the drive to, to get it, to explore it and to dive into it is just so strong. And the idea to complete something is, is so big that just drives me through. So you definitely don't get into this for money. Um, you know, documentary, you don't make um, very much, you know, you can, you can make a living from it if you're lucky, but it's, it's, you've got to really push things. And so I think it's just that, yes, my slight OCD nature, I get very, single-minded on a topic and it's all I want to do and then I yeah I'm very intense about things and if I'm not all into something um I I will not be into it at all so it's like very hot and cold but if I'm on something then that drive is just very uh very strong which when you're making a documentary which is can take a really long time and a lot of effort that's a good thing to have I think I don't know how healthy it is overall but because I sort of ignore the rest of my life while I'm trying to complete something. But I find it really helps me in what I do. And uh, I, I would agree with you. And I think too, it's, it's interesting that kind of uh, comparison, comparing and contrasting, you know, like bands in regards to record cycles, you know, they put out a record, they, you know, in a normal world, they would tour for two to three years and maybe put out another record, but mm-hmm. um, you know, filmmaking uh, and specifically documentary filmmaking, like, yes, the process can take longer, but it, it, it does seem that sort of uh, singular focus of like when a band is preparing to record their record, it's the same sort of thing where, you know, they're like disconnecting from their lives and just being like, okay, we're, we're focused on getting this thing out in the world. And uh, I, I think it's a very, uh, you know, uh, apt uh, comparison between those two. And I'm yeah, sure and you've and maybe noticed it. There's different phases as well. Cause like when you're, um, you know, pre-production is like the most fun, but you know, you get the idea, you you maybe got a little bit of funding behind you and you know, all you can see is the possibility of what it can be. And then, when you're shooting, I completely lose myself in shooting because you're just lost in this world of whatever you're in. And when you're not filming, you're driving somewhere or you're still investigating or, you know, you, I just, I don't, my emails just like stack up while you're shooting and you just like completely lose yourself in it. And then, you know, the edit is another, um, the other part of it where you just really have to be all in. And I work with an editor usually that I love and, we're working together at something. And so when I finish recording with you, I'm going to go into the edit and you just lose yourself in that. You can't be trying to crack your story and try and make that work and edit while you're doing other things. Like it's all, you don't answer your phone. You just like, it's all on. You're just so focused on what you're trying to achieve in the booth. So yeah, when you're in the middle of a of, of doc, you do just completely lose yourself in the process. And it probably, yeah, it probably is like when you're when you're on tour in a way. It's just or or, or recording an album. It's just like it's very hard to maintain um, the rest of your life. And I don't and I don't know how a lot of people do. And I think it probably a lot of people don't. Yeah, just, this is like, well, this this part, <laughs> I have to put all of myself in this. Otherwise, uh, you know, the the rest of my life will be consumed by the thing that I'm only thinking about. Like, I can't balance between the two for those obvious reasons. Yeah, hundred percent. And if you, I think if you don't put all of yourself into your work, it can end up being a real piece of shit. Unless you're incredibly talented and you can put minimal effort in and somehow make something genius. But I'm right. not like that. I just have to focus all, I just everything has to go into what I'm working on or it's not going to be any good. Sure, sure. I love dogs so much. That's why I'm incredibly excited to welcome Embark on as a sponsor. They are a dog DNA testing kit. And what makes them cool is they scan for 215 genetic health risks across 350 breeds. And I want to give you $60 off and free shipping. So go to EmbarkVet.com, use the promo code Ray, and it unlocks that offer. And it also unlocks so many cool things that you can find out about your pup. And it's super easy. You get a little test tube with a Q-tip, 
You put it in the pup's mouth, send it back to Embark. They email you all of these results. It's very fast, easy, and I love doing it. 72% of pup parents are puzzled when it comes to their dog's breed. It's time to end these guessing games. This holiday season, give the dog lover in your life something they won't expect, the chance to decode their dog. It's the perfect time to shop for an Embark dog DNA test. Right now, Embark has a limited time offer on their breed and health kit and purebred kit for listeners of this show. Go to EmbarkVet.com to get free shipping and save $60 with promo code RAY. Visit EmbarkVet.com and use promo code RAY to save $60 today. Do it for your pup. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Wouldn't it be absolutely incredible if you got an instruction guide for life where you're going through some relationship issues or drama at work or whatever challenging situation that is presented to you? You got a little pamphlet that helped you walk through that. What's awesome about therapy is that it kind of is. You're able to speak to a third person, talk about the issues you're having, and they can maybe offer some solutions for you that you can get unstuck. BetterHelp has connected over 3 million people and counting with licensed therapists 100% online. So that means it is more convenient, more accessible, and more affordable. You just fill out a brief questionnaire and you get matched with the therapist in less than 48 hours. If things are not vibing between you and the therapist, you can switch out to a new therapist at any time. You got no waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. It's an amazing service and I wholeheartedly endorse them. Learn more and save 10% off your first month when you sign up today at betterhelp.com slash ray. That's betterhelp.com slash ray. Get some therapy and get unstuck. Have you ever watched your favorite medical drama and wondered if the science was factual and real? Well, look no further. This is the podcast for you. On Call with KB promises to take listeners through some of the wildest episodes of your favorite medical shows, assessing their accuracy and having fun while doing it. This season, we're focusing on the biggest and boldest episodes of Grey's Anatomy and addressing topics like, can a baby really be born with its heart outside of its body and still survive? Join myself in my wild array of illustrious guests ranging from doctors to directors and even super fans as we talk real life cases, reminisce about the best show moments and spill some behind the scenes tea. Listen to On Call with KB on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, the idea that, you know, I mean, because you yourself inject like, you know, you are literally in all most of the things that you do from you know tickled and dark mm. tourists like you are you know a personality <laughs> and i use that maybe in air quotes because yeah, you yeah. know you but uh, i'm sure there's has there or has there been had in your own head to kind of grapple with the idea of you know people recognizing you and people knowing you and then expecting certain things from you and yes i mean that in you know a sliding scale like clearly people expect a lot more from tom cruise than they do you or whatever <laughs> um yeah. but but like, you know, there there is that notion of uh, you know being a public figure and then putting yourself out there. And how have you tried to kind of keep that uh, balance in your own life to be like, well, I am this human, but then I, these are also my interests and that sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think I <clears throat> I'm in a really sweet spot because I the work I do is relatively niche, and so it's not like I'm um, it, it's a, a nice spot where if I if I get recognized if someone wants to talk to me about something, it's like a nice thing. And I, it's nice being told that someone liked your, what you, something you've made or done. Um, and it's a positive and I, and I don't mind that. Um, and it doesn't interfere too much with my life in general. It's funny. Like I get more, the, the pace is probably a pain is almost at like at shows and at, and at um, gigs because I, in, in New Zealand, I sort of, cause I reported so much on that stuff when I was a, and that the sort of the culture art reporting section a lot of people know that i like that music and so at gigs i'll like kind of find my people and people will like very adamantly come up to me and talk to me and want to interact and that can be you know that's fine but sometimes you just want to sort of disappear a little bit as well but in day-to-day -day life um i'm in a sweet spot where like i'm not famous i'm not um and occasionally i'll meet people that like what i do and that's a really nice experience and the additional thing is, I guess, when you work in journalism and doc, you can get some really good ideas from people and you kind of need to meet people. And that's where you get a lot of stuff from. Um, 
And so it's it's kind of positive for me sometimes to have these conversations. And if someone might maybe likes my work and likes what I do, you know, I've had other ideas that have come from people just wandering up and saying, hey, have you thought about this? Or I've got this thing that's happened to me. And that can kind of lead to other stories as well. That uh, that's interesting because I didn't think about it in those terms of you know and again I'm always going to pull back to music too where the idea that you know the the joke is that it the a band releasing their first record they have their whole life to write that and then they've got yeah. two years to write their yeah, follow up surreal right I often think of um you know Lord here in New Zealand who's this big our big yep. hit and she's amazing and you know she, first record like holy shit royals and she's had a whole whatever it was at the time 16 16 years of life 17 years of life and, but sure. now like you know the next one yeah she's got shit she's got two years and that two years is like of course going to be about being famous and all the shit that happens because the first album is like you're not famous yet second record and then yeah her third record is going to be uh it'll be interesting because what do you write about um, right and yeah no I hadn't actually thought of it in that way it's uh, yeah less and less uh, new things to less material to mine I suppose yeah ab- absolutely and especially too what you're talking about where like you know most people like regardless of their level of fame or experience like you need to have quote unquote real life happening to you you can't be so far removed from it because you're not you know planting those pardon the pardon the metaphor but planting those seeds to be able to grow to no, get to a point like, yeah where I you mean, can't you know, someone like you know tom cruise probably quite annoying for him going out because everyone knows who he is they all come up and talk to him he's not getting scripts out of them or getting work out of them whereas i feel like if i'm out there meeting people then it can lead to other stories and other things and I, i've i've the last in the last year i've started this newsletter called webworm which is like and sort of an independent it's a you know newsletters are kind of having a comeback at the moment and so i'm writing that i'm probably like writing that sort of three times a week like three stories a week and you know it's that kind of the stories i write are kind of generated from people i've met or conversations i've had and it's been a really fun experience because it's you know it's fully independent i'm my own editor i've got um the people that like my stuff sign up and i talk directly to them and You know, but already, you know, one of the stories I told on there is like I'm sort of working that into another type of storytelling. And so it's it's like a a place where ideas can start and turn into other things. And, you know, I think back to Tickled and that started as a series of really informal blogs that I did at the time that you can't find anymore. But I was writing about that before it was a documentary. And so I find the process of writing Um, and just kind of sending those things out into the world, seeing how people react. That's kind of a good litmus test for, oh, maybe this would be a film or a podcast or it should exist in a longer form. And so I've been really enjoying that process of writing the newsletter because it's a place where I can feel out a story and see if it could maybe be something else as well. And and No, it it feels like that in in reading it. It's definitely... um uh, kick you're, you're kicking the tires where you're just like it like is this i know this is interesting to me but like is anybody is this resonating with anybody else um, yeah and the great like, thing is it's like it's quite a um you know it's uh, you're kind of lucky in a writer because i'm writing to people that like what i've made so they're already on side so like some of my stuff that i send out is very loose and it's, it wouldn't probably pass the muster for the new york times or something but because it's just a really informal thing i send out to people that follow my stuff i can sort of experiment with things and try things out and again you hear from people you hear from readers with other story ideas and other things and uh yeah it's kind of i I like that way of um experiencing uh the world sure absolutely kind of going back to your uh you know music journalist days and newsroom and stuff like that uh, i'm sure you had uh some pretty hilarious uh whether it was like you making mistakes or um you know d- just doing something where you're just like oh man i just came off like an idiot uh, do you have any things uh that kind of jumbles around in your brain uh when i when i say something like that uh, you know bringing something up to an artist or failing at an interview and that sort of stuff I, and the only reason i ask that is not to embarrass you but i no, just find no, no, it's the fun part yeah. of it it's like no the embarrassing stories are the fun ones i mean sure i know i mean i came across as an idiot so 
many times. I mean, I, I had a really terrible time with Gene Simmons from Kiss. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, he was just a real. He was. He did not like me at all, and I, and I, um, in New Zealand in summer, we often wear jandals, like they're like flip flops. I think maybe you call them in America. Yeah. Um, sa- you know. Um. So we, I was wearing. Um. I turned up this interview and like, sh- cause I, you know, I, I wear shorts and t-shirt and I dress pretty informally in that role. And I turned up in flip flops and Gene just hated them and hated that I hadn't dressed up for the interview. I think he wanted me to sort of come dressed sort of immaculately or qu- in quite a fancy way. And I was the opposite and he got, he was just really mean spirited and like just turned his nose up at me. And it was very funny. Like it was a really fun story. Um, I think I've got it on my YouTube somewhere, but it's, he just hates me and it's so obvious on screen. And so that was quite a fun one. Um, Gene Simmons. Uh, uh, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of, that's probably the one that stands out as just being quite funny because the talent hated me so much. <laughs> right. Um, like you, no, no matter what you were going to be uh, quote unquote unsuccessful with this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. A hundred percent. And that's, um, and that's, uh, uh, the, probably the other, the other, and it's probably, it's less music, but I got in, I, I did film junkets for a while in LA and I'd fly from New Zealand to LA for the weekend and get like a two minute slot with, you know it's, it's whatever the actor is like christian bale for batman or whatever and those are always so awkward because um probably like the worst one of those was sitting down with jared leto who i think people have you either love him or hate him don't you but he um he was just um he wouldn't look at me i walked into the room and all the cameras are set up and you know you usually walk in there and you're like hello and they greet you and you know they try and everyone sort of hates junkets but um, and you're like the 20th person they've seen that day. And so it's not very fun for the person doing the interview either. But he was looking at his phone and he just refused to acknowledge that I was there. He didn't say anything to me. He refused to sh- I put my hand up to shake his hand. And he was like, I don't shake hands. And this was pre-pandemic. And sure, I, I understand some people don't like shaking hands and that's fine. But he was just so cold about it. And then refused to look at me until they counted down and like, right, your two minutes starts now. And then he just like put a little act on and like turned on and pretended to be interested. And then when that two minutes is up and your interview's over, uh, he just instantly just like stopped looking at me and just went back on his phone. Sure. And it was disposable. uh, Yeah. So I've never been, I've never um, been treated as, it was just like a very funny experience meeting him and how, obviously in his own world um that man is and he's a musician isn't he so there you go actor slash musician Jared. yeah yeah right well and I, it's interesting because i i think that it's probably um you know not giving him a pass but just looking at the notion of uh, you know emotional capital and like that you know can mean so many different things to so many different people but like because he's been you know famous for arguably most of his life just the idea of him being like okay this is how much time i can give to this person and it's two minutes and like i can't do anything else which obviously is like ridiculous to even think about but just like that he has done that mental yeah. process you know where it's like oh yeah this is i i can't spend any time with this this rando and 40 other randos this day no totally he just didn't have time for it he didn't want to be there and it, which is fine it's just it was just a funny it's not yeah. often when you meet another human that there's such a dissonance because I'm so eager to make him comfortable. So he just has a good time and he's just has, you know, he's not going to even attempt to, 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 <laughs> to go there. Yeah, and he's like, I don't... Interviewing people, like often it's the people that have been doing it. You know, I, I feel like in music interviewing like young bands is like a nightmare because then you do it. They've got nothing. If you're just talking about the tour and the album, you know, they don't have like a lot of wisdom to sort of share. It's like the old school guys would be like, I I had such a nice time sitting down with like Dave Mustaine from Megadeth. He was just so great to talk to and he has such a history and he was so kind. Like Kerry King from Slayer was amazing. Um, He was just like the nicest person. So many stories, wanted to be there appreciative i think of where he was and what he had done and so like generally over that time of 
like interviewing musicians, it was the ones who've been doing it for a long time and that I think appreciated the fans and and sort of got that relationship that were the most fun to talk to. Like the up and coming people were just so full of bravado and swagger that, that it would just often be a bit of a nightmare. Uh, and then occasionally you'd get the ones like Jared Leto who were uh, just in their own world entirely devoid of um, and divorced of, of reality. <laughs> right, right. You're like, I'm, I'm not even needed here, so yeah, I'll I just go ahead. I did, not, didn't, I did absolutely not need to be there. And what's so <laughs> right. funny about it is like, that's a, like the system of publicity for films is so silly. Like they'd flown me from New Zealand to Los Angeles for that two minutes with that <laughs> which is so dumb i mean just do it on skype i mean for crying out loud but for a totally while, you know for me it was fun to have a weekend in, in la and i'm grateful for it but very silly when you look back on it right right you're like wow i i just really uh you know was able to pull out this amazing two minutes worth of content and like oh my yeah God, it's so it's so embarrassing like, i hate to think of like the the uh the the damage to the environment um that particular flight did <laughs> wow right that fucking guy yeah yeah this is, and this has happened with hundreds of other people over oh the past years and yeah, yeah yeah uh last thing i want to hit on was the uh you know the notion of the, like the business side of things and you know this is something that i often talk about with uh, anybody creating art uh, is that there's always business implications whether you know you're the band planning the tour being like oh i've got to order 20 t-shirts and i need to charge mm-hmm. x amount of dollars and you know usually there's like one or two band members that might have proclivity towards that um you know for you specifically how has the kind of the business side of things, uh, you know, been able to play itself out with you? I mean, clearly you've been able, you know, you've been successful enough to, you know, actually get products out into the world and, uh, you know, your art to people. But, you know, do you, I guess, like the business side of things or is that just kind no, of a necessary no, not evil? At all. Like, I, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not interested at all in that side of things. And I probably haven't been smart about things. And I, if ever, if I'm making something, I need to work with a producer who can deal with the money and the, and the sales and, and trying to get it out into the world. Like I'm not very, I'm like, I'm a good, I'm, I'm, I'm a good self promoter. I think. And that once something's done, I like talking about it and getting it out there into the world, but money and, um, the money side, I just have no, interest in and i think i mean it's it's been fine for me because i if, if the work's good i think you find a way to um make something out of it and that's that's great but yeah business side i'm very motivated to make the thing and to write what i write and to and to do that and then the money is a, or any sort of business side is is very secondary for me, which isn't a great way to be because I'm sure I could be smarter about things and um, that would allow me more freedom to do certain things, but it's just not part of my makeup. Sure. Well, that, I mean, that's good. You recognize that because you can, uh, you know, hopefully work with people to, you know, uh, watch some of your interests or be able mm. to make, make sure that something gets executed appropriately as opposed to just like, well, whatever, I'm just going to, make these films for myself and put them up on Vimeo. No, cause you, yeah. Cause you do need to be, um, you do need to be smart with that stuff. And I think I've got enough sense now where I realize what is worth putting my time into, because I don't want to be one of those, you know, there are documentary makers and there's friends I know that work like this and they just put so much of their own money into films that they're still working on. And it really, it really makes life difficult to live like that. And I, I just, I don't think that's the way, that's not the way I live. Like I, if there's a project, I make sure that I have secured funding for it. And that, again, that's working with the producer. Um, you know, I've got some investment in it and I, I've got like, I, I never want to put too much of my own money into a thing because it's just, it's too stressful. I'm 38 and I just don't want to live like that. So I've got, I've got enough. That's kind of my philosophy of like, if a project's good enough to, pour your life into then you should be able to get support from other funding bodies to like help make that thing it shouldn't just be your money pouring into that thing because it's too much of a gamble like you don't know whether it's going to sell you don't know whether netflix is going to want a thing or it's just going to like go nowhere so i think you want to i've got enough sense that i think you need to realize it's going to work financially before you just randomly pour your heart into something i mean the mongolian death room thing which i mentioned earlier that was 
something I'd never do again. I put all my own money into it. I didn't really know what I was doing. I never made it. That's not a model I would repeat again of just like investing in myself heavily to like try a thing to see if it works. I'd want to, I want to have it really the infrastructure set up beforehand to make sure that I can make this thing from beginning to end and not at least not come out in the negatives. You know, you at least want to come out in a, in a neutral sort of state at the end of it. Sure. To be able to actually do something else again in the future, as opposed to like, well, that was my one chance. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. And that's funny. Like I, I keep hacking on about this newsletter, but I'm so excited about that format of journalism at the moment, because with, with web I, I write like my best stuff for free or what I say is my, I think the most important or interesting. And that goes out to subscribers for free. There's a pay model where people can pay like $6 a month and, They will, I only say to people, sign up for this if it is financially viable for you to do, because you're not going to get my best stuff. You're just going to get my more personal stuff and things that are a bit more niche and weird. And that's the perfect system because like Webroom is worth, financially it's worth writing. I can justify putting the time into it because those paying subscribers allow you to do that, but you're never cutting people off. There's never like a, it's not like a system with, the New York Times say where you click on a thing and it's like, oh, paywall. I can't read that thing. All my stuff that I think is the most valuable, and I've I've been doing a lot of writing about conspiracy theories this year and QAnon. All that stuff that I think is important, I never put behind a paywall. It's only like my silly bullshit that goes behind a paywall. So, what am I saying? I just think as as far as independence goes in journalism, I'm really excited about. Um, sort of this this resurgence in newsletters that that are are coming out at the moment because it just avoids a lot of problems that i'm seeing in mainstream journalism with with paywalls and the way you get information out obviously we still need newsrooms because you know a a newsletter is very one-sided it's just um i've got no editor and you don't want journalism to just be that but as someone who likes to experiment with ideas and get things out there it's kind of perfect yeah, absolutely. Well, everything that is old is new again. So it's great that email yeah, yeah. is important yeah, still. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, David, thank you so much for hanging out, dude. I really appreciate you letting me, uh, you know, uh, pick, pick parts of your brain that haven't been picked in, in a little bit. <laughs> no, no, it's really fun. And I, uh, it, it's nice talking to you. And it's just, it's so funny. We have that mutual friend. And um, I think in um, Aaron as well from, from ISIS, because yeah, as I say, that was, Isis was one of the first sort of bands I probably saw when I um, was sort of getting out of my um, one phase of my life into another. So it's funny how these things all come around again. It, it does. It does. <laughs> that's uh, that's that's the beauty of music. It pulls people together, and you're just like, oh yeah, like you're uh, we're, we're one and the same. You know, we yeah, just had different exactly. experiences. Exactly. Yeah. What a pleasant chap, right? It was uh, interesting to talk to David because, uh, you know, we kind of developed a uh, email relationship after this. And uh, he was like, he was he was apologetic in many respects because he was like, yeah, I'm sorry that, you know, our life is pretty normal and yours isn't. <laughs> I'm just like, man, the luxury to live in New Zealand, right? Oh, geez. But anyways, I hope that, uh, you know, our world returns back to normal and we can see bands play again because that's what I want so desperately. But thank you, David, for coming on the show. And I appreciate uh, your interest in this thing and music and caring about the dark sides of the world because uh, it's interesting, right? Next week, we have Joe Nelson, a in my opinion, legend within the OC hardcore scene uh, has been attached to a lot of different bands like Ignite and Quicksand and, uh, you know, was the original vocalist uh, many moons ago for Ignite. But he runs a label called Trust Records, who uh, are just very dedicated to putting out some high quality reissues and releases that may have fallen out of print, but are important in the whole context of the punk and hardcore scene. So, uh, That's what we got next week. Joe Nelson on the show, and I can't wait. So until then, please be safe, everybody. Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. 
Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches, urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back, and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com. The world of chocolate has been turned upside down. A very unusual situation. You saw the stacks of cash in our office. Chocolate comes from the cacao tree. And recently, varieties of cacao, thought to have been lost centuries ago, were rediscovered in the Amazon. There is no chocolate on earth like this. Now some chocolate makers are racing deep into the jungle to find the next game-changing chocolate. And I'm coming along. Okay, that was a very large crocodile. Listen to Obsessions Wild Chocolate on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Molly Jongfast, and this is Fast Politics. You may know me from my old podcast, The New Abnormal, or my articles in Vogue, The New York Times, The Washington Post, or my newsletter at The Atlantic. I do my best to poke holes in political arguments with no fear of critiquing any side of the political spectrum. Listen to Fast Politics with Molly Jongfast every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.